Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology, and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the A-level biology topics. This is classification. Topic for B1, the principles of classification. We begin by looking at biodiversity. Biodiversity measures the variety of living organisms as well as their genetic differences, meaning it takes into account the different alleles that are found within a specific environment or within a specific population for a specific feature. To quantify biodiversity, we need to identify the different groups of organisms, and this could be classified into groups based on similarities as well as differences. Classification is carried out to create an internationally recognized way of identifying different groups of organisms, and it can also clarify ancestral relationships. The main taxonomic groups of classification, here we talk about how living organisms are classified into kingdoms, into phylum, class, order, family, genus, as well as species. And this is based on the three domain system where there are six kingdoms. And again, we'll talk about this later. Within the three domain system, we have the archaea domain, which contains the archaea bacteria. We have the bacteria domain, and this includes the Ubacteria kingdom. We have the Eukarya or Eukaryota domain, and this includes the protists, which include amoeba, as well as some green algae. We have fungi, these are all heterotrophs, and this includes those that are saprotrophs as well as some that are parasitic. We have plantae, this includes all autotrophs that contain chlorophyll, they include flowering and non-flowering plants. And in Animalia, we are all are heterotrophs, and this includes the vertebrae, which we have here, as well as the invertebrates. This should be mollusks, including snails and so on. Through the process of classification, different groups of organisms can be named, and this is done using the binomial system, which gives two Latin names. The first name is going to be for the genus, and the second name is going to be for the species, and that identifies that specific organism precisely. So we need to remember the rules of writing the binomial names. Of course, they're going to be written in italics. However, the first name is going to have an uppercase. The second name is not going to have an uppercase. So for example, this name is in italics, we can see this one has a capital or uppercase at the beginning, and then this one here has a lowercase. Binomial names can also be abbreviated, like we see here. Instead of writing Bellis perennis, we can write B perennis. When we do that, we put a full stop after the genus name, and then include the species name as a full one. So here I put some example of two butterflies that belong to the same genus, and we can see they have certain anatomical features that are kind of similar. Moving on to topic 4b2, what is a species? Species can be categorized based on the outside appearance, and this includes the morphological concept. So through the morphological species concept, organisms are classified based on morphology or how they look. Observable similarities as well as differences are used in carrying out the classification. However, because the appearance of an organism can be affected by various things, sometimes the variations are going to occur even among closely related organisms, like in this case, we have the peahen as well as the peacock. They are organisms of the same species, but because of sexual dimorphism, they appear to have great external differences or great morphological differences, and they could be classified as different species, even though they belong to the same species. So the idea of sexual dimorphism weakens the morphological concept in classifying what a species is. Next, we go to the reproductive and biological species model. According to this, a species is a group of organisms with similar characteristics that interbreed to produce fertile offsprings. Using this reproductive and biological species concept, it overcomes the problems associated with sexual dimorphism, because in this case we can see organisms are going to be able to produce fertile offsprings. So the peacock and the peahen can have fertile offsprings, and therefore we can classify them as belonging to the same species. However, not all organisms can attempt to interbreed with each other in order to produce fertile offsprings because not all organisms within the same species live in a specific area or in the same area. If two individuals from a population met, they are considered the same species if fertile offsprings are produced. And again, this is based on the reproductive and biological concept or if there is gene flow from the parents to the offsprings. Looking at the case of donkeys and horses, they look similar. However, when they mate, they produce tara offsprings. So based on this reproductive and biological concept, we do not classify them as being the same species. 
However, the idea of some organisms that actually belong to different species, mating and producing offsprings that are fertile, for example, lions and tigers, which are different species, can form ligers that are actually fertile. This weakens the definition of a species based on the reproductive and biological concept, so it means we have to look for another suitable way of defining what a species is. So to overcome the limitations we have seen before, they came up with two slightly more sophisticated definitions of a species, and the first one is a group of organisms with similar characteristics that are all potentially capable of breeding to produce fertile offsprings. So putting the word potentially, meaning the responsibility for them to produce fertile offsprings, and then a group of organisms in which gene flow can occur between individuals. Going on to other possible definitions of a species, we can use the ecological species model. This is based on the specific ecological niche occupied by a specific organism. So we can use that to classify organisms as belonging to the same species. There is also the mate recognition model. Here, certain unique fertilization systems, including mating behavior, as well as certain rituals, if they are recognized by two different organisms, then we could classify them as belonging to the same species. There is also the genetic species model. This is based on DNA evidence. If two organisms have close genetic similarities, then they could be classified as belonging to the same species. However, when we use DNA evidence to classify, we have to make a decision on how much genetic difference there should be for organisms to be classified as different species. So this can limit the idea of using the genetic species model. Moving on to the limitations of the species model. Number one is finding a mate. This is because some organisms may never have been observed mating, so they can set up breeding programs to observe mating between two different organisms. However, this could be time consuming and it can be expensive. Also, closely related plants have been seen to interbreed and they do produce fertile hybrids. So the question is, should we recognize these hybrids as belonging to a different species or belonging to the same species of their parent? Also, some organisms like bacteria and fungi, as well as protists, do not reproduce sexually. So the definition we have used based on reproductive behavior is going to be irrelevant to these organisms that do not reproduce sexually. Also, there are those organisms that have already been fossilized. And for those, we have no accessible DNA. So the question is, how can these be classified if we are using DNA or other methods instead of using the morphological concept? So these are all questions that limit the different definitions. Of what a species is. So here we look at the importance of DNA in classification. DNA can be sequenced and DNA sequencing can lead to DNA profiling which looks at the non-coding areas of DNA to identify patterns. These patterns are going to show us similarities as well as differences between different organisms. DNA sequencing as well as profiling generates a lot of data and this data can be hard to interpret so we can use bioinformatics in order to understand the generated data. Bioinformatics uses software as well as computing tools to analyze the raw biological data in order to establish or find out relationships between those data so that interpretations can be done. Similarities as well as differences in genes as well as other biological molecules like proteins can be identified. This helps us to classify organisms that are genetically related but phenotypically different due to environmental conditions. The example referred to is this, and again, this is from your textbook. We can see these different fungal cultures. They all look similar, but based on DNA evidence, they are all different species, even when they cause a similar disease. So DNA analysis can be very important in classifying organisms as being members of the same species or belonging to different species. Moving on to topic 4B3, domains, kingdoms, or both. Moving on to gel electrophoresis. This is a technique which is a variation of chromatography. In this case, we separate DNA and RNA fragments, then proteins or amino acids according to their size as well as charge. So basically, this is where electrophoresis is going to occur. And we see there is going to be a negative electrode, which is a cathode, and a positive electrode, which is an anode. And since DNA is going to be negatively charged, it's going to be poured towards the negative electrode, and it's going to go through this gel towards the positive electrode. The distance traveled by the DNA fragments or protein fragments is going to be based on their sizes. So we can see those that have traveled farther away from the negative electrode are going to be the lightest, while those that are still closer to the negative electrode are going to be the heaviest. Also, we can observe bands. Bands that are thicker, they show that the fragment is going to be in a higher concentration, and those that are thinner 
show that the concentration is going to be lower. This one, I've already said, the bands that are closer to the negative electrode show the heavier DNA, and those that are closer to the positive electrode show the lightest DNA. So we will compare, and again, these are going to be different samples. Maybe this sample is from one organism and this is for another. If the bands show up at the same distance from the point where the DNA was put into the wells, then we can say there are some similarities between the bands in the different groups of organisms. Moving on to more biochemical relationships, we can analyze different chemicals or different compounds from certain organisms in order to establish relationships. For example, blood pigments. Some organisms that produce the same blood pigment are going to be closely related. For example, hemoglobin is produced in both vertebrates and invertebrates, so we can see that they're going to be closely related. There is also hemocyanin, which is present in crustaceans. Also, we can do amino acid sequences in proteins. In mammals, analysis of fibrinogen can show genetic differences in different groups of mammals, and that means if the best sequence is closer or closely related, then those mammals are closely related to each other. In conclusion, we can use DNA analysis, we can use protein analysis, we can look at anatomical observations, and all these can be used to demonstrate or show relationships within organisms in order to classify them appropriately. Moving on to the endosymbiosis theory, we're going to look at how eukaryotic organisms changed over time or evolved over time for some to contain both mitochondria as well as chloroplasts. I'm going to begin with how the non-plant cell was produced. This is in eukaryotes that are not plant cells or that are not photosynthetic cells. So here we see a specific prokaryote organism which was aerobic and uh, here we see a eukaryotic organism that was anaerobic meaning it did not have mitochondria. And then the cell, which was the prokaryotic organism capable of carrying out aerobic respiration, was engulfed by this eukaryotic cell, and by chance this was not digested, and it became part of the cell. So it gave this cell a benefit because now the cell can carry out aerobic respiration, and this is allowing it to produce more ATP in order to carry out more cellular reactions. And now we produce a eukaryotic cell that can carry out aerobic respiration, because the mitochondria, which is an organelle, has now become part or a permanent component of that cell. Moving on to the plant cell or how photosynthetic cells originated, here we have a photosynthetic organism, which is basically an early prokaryotic cell. And again, we have an ancestral eukaryotic cell. We can see there is a nucleus and it already has the mitochondria. We can see it engulfs the photosynthetic organism as food. And again, here by chance, it's not digested and it gives an added benefit to this cell, meaning it can now photosynthesize. So together they go into a mutualistic relationship, and over time, it eventually becomes part of the cell, and this is going to be a photosynthetic organism, which contain chloroplasts, and during cell division, more of these chloroplasts are going to be made in order for the daughter cells to have the same components. Looking at molecular and cellular characteristics of the three domains, here again, the things that I marked, you can see those that I marked are the ones that I think are more important. For a membrane-enclosed nucleus, this is going to be absent in bacteria, absent in archaea, but it's going to be present in eukaryota. All eukaryotic organisms have membrane-bound organelles. We can also see this. They have that, but they're absent in the bacteria as well as archaea. The peptidoglycan cell wall is going to be present in bacteria. It's absent in archaea, and it's absent in eukaryota or eukarya. The membrane lipids, of course, these are going to be present in all. However, these are going to be unbranched. These are branched and those are unbranched. And again, there is an ester link for all. Looking at the ribosomes, bacteria have the 70S ribosome. These have 70S, but these have 80S. If you want, you can talk about the initiator. But of course, we know in eukaryota, methionine is the first amino acid when you're making a protein. Here's going to be formal methionine, and this is also going to be methionine. Operants are going to be present in bacteria as well as archaea. Eukarya do not have operants. Of course, plasmids are going to be present in some bacteria, in some archaea. They're going to be rare in eukaryota. RNA polymerase, these ones have one, one, but there is going to be three in eukarya. And again, and so many more until some conduct chlorophyll-based photosynthesis. Of course, some bacteria are photosynthetic, archaea are not, and then some eukarya are going to be photosynthetic as well.
So you have to take time and look through mainly those ones that I marked because they are more important in order to do your exam appropriately. Next, we look at dealing with scientific findings. This question rarely comes, but sometimes they can ask you if somebody has come up with experimental data, how are they going to deal with that? They can submit that data to peer reviewers. Peer reviewers are a group of scientists who are going to review the new scientific findings in order to see if they are appropriate to be published or not. And then if it's acceptable, they can publish it for other people to see. You can also publish this on certain websites. You can use television, you can use radio and so on. So basically scientific findings have to be sent out to other people who can look at that or who can learn from the experimental findings. Lastly, we are looking at how many kingdoms. And of course, you remember there is a two domain system, five kingdom system, or the three domain system, six kingdom system. Looking at the two domain system, which includes only five kingdoms, we have the kingdom Monera. This is where we had the prokaryotes. And then the eukaryotes will include the protista, the fungi, the planti, and the animalia. And then when we go to the three domain system, which is going to give us the six kingdoms, we have the domain bacteria that gives us the O bacteria we see here. We have the archaea domain, and that is going to give us the archaea bacteria. And we have the eukaryota domain, which is going to give us these four kingdoms, which is the protista kingdom, the fungi kingdom, the planty kingdom, and the animalia kingdom. And of course, I included some examples of these organisms. For example, archaea include extremophiles. Extremophiles are organisms that can live in extreme conditions, like very cold conditions, very hot conditions, or maybe temperature over 100, and then maybe areas where there is high pressure, high levels of toxicity, and so on. Eubacteria include chanobacteria. Protista include the green algae, the brown algae, as well as thymol. molds. And then the fungi, of course, these are unicellular as well as some multicellular, including yeast, toads to molds, and planty, of course, all those that are photosynthetic. And animalia, these are going to be multicellular, and these include most of the animals we see. So this brings us to the end of this topic. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.